good evening. Hope everyone's doing good tonight. I'm a little late getting on here. Um, better late than never. So uh, I'm going to wait just a minute for some people to get on. If not, I guess uh, y'all can catch it on the replay. I now have a microphone in the mix. So hope everybody can pick me up a little bit better. Hope it's working. Um, I did not announce it on my Facebook because I honestly was not sure if I was going to be going live tonight. But I found a little space, a little window of opportunity and stepped in. But we are still in the book of John. If you're first tuning in, we are going to be beginning in chapter 4. Now, all right. We're going to be in chapter 4 of the book of John. This is the Gospel of John. Not 1 John, but the Gospel of John. We're going to start at chapter 4. Now, I'm going to do some reading here. I'm going to read through a, quite, a, quite a few verses, so just bear with me. I just want to get through this first. So John chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee, and he needed to go through Samaria. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that says unto thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman said unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence, from whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which he gave us, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him in a excuse me. But the water I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water, that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus said to her, Go call thy husband and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus, answered, Jesus said to her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands. And he whom thou hast now is not thy husband, in that thou saidest truly. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. <laughs> you think? He just pretty much just read her life right out in front of her. Our fathers worshipped him in this mountain, and, excuse me, our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said unto her, Woman, believe me. The hour comes when you shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The woman said unto him, I know that the Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. For when he is come, he will tell us all things. Jesus said unto her, 
I that speak unto thee am he. So I was going to stop right there. Hello, Lisa. Um, what we're reading right here, well, let's just start off right now. Like the, If you look in the very first few verses, it says, uh, you know, the Pharisees are learning that Jesus has become more popular than John the Baptist. You know, his ministry, learned in the last chapter, we see that the end, the end of chapter 2 that Jesus' ministry is getting larger, is getting, is getting bigger. And that's when, uh, you know, John the Baptist said that I must decrease for him to increase. Um, we also learned in, in, in Matthew now, if you read that, they had sent out spies before, like the Pharisees and Sadducees, to observe, observe John's ministry. And that's back, I believe, in Matthew chapter 3. They were likely planning the same thing in order to keep tabs on Jesus' ministry. Because like I said, he, you know, his ministry is spreading like wildfire. His is getting larger than John the Baptist was. And, and if it was larger than John the Baptist, it's almost common sense. They're sending spies to check out his camp, to check, it, check out what's going on there. So, you know, and he often condemned, you know, Jesus, he wasn't scared of them or anything. You know, he often condemned them and responded to their testing questions, but you see that he was, he, he dipped out. You know, he went ahead and left when he found out that the, you know, the Pharisees had heard about him and his ministry. So he went ahead and dipped out and left. Now, like I said, he wasn't scared. You know, he often called them out to their face and everything. But just like in John 2, he, you know, he, he said that his time has not come. So what we can learn from that verse is there is a time for everything. You know, and that was not on his divine timeline yet. So, you know, um, we move on right here. We, well, before we move on, look at it like this. He wasn't scared of them. Could he have confronted them? Could he have uh, answered their questions and, and, and had a, a divine approach for it? Yes, but, you know, it evidently wasn't the right time for Jesus to begin that confrontation with the Pharisees yet, so that's why he left. You know, most of his confrontation with them came about when, you know, he went to Jerusalem in order to minister. So there it would be hard to minister without drawing their attention and conflict coming out of it. So look at it like this. He he did he avoided some needless confrontation at that time because that would interrupt on what his main mission was. And at that time it was not needed for him to confront them and go back and forth with him. You know, so if it was to distract from his ministry, he chose to skip it. And uh, and we can learn that the same thing, you know, when we're sharing the gospel to someone that, you know, if we got to use discretion when we're going to confront others about, you know, some things. And that's, you got to read the situation. There's no right or necessarily or no wrong answer, but always use discretion. You can't always, you can, but it ain't necessarily always wise to call everybody out on everything at any given moment. And you, you, you back it up with saying you're doing right, you're going to nothing slide, but what is it going to profit? You know, our job is to lead people to Christ, lead them in the right direction, you know. Can you think of, of times and examples that, you know, it would be beneficial to correct others and, and then sometimes when it might necessarily not be the right time to correct others, you know? You got to just look at different situations. There's plenty of times that I feel like I made the wrong choice and just because I knew what someone was doing was incorrect or wrong or a sin, or I knew that, you know, they 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 were interpreting something wrong, or you know, it, sometimes it's needed for correction at that time. But you got to read the situation, you got to pray about it, you got to, you know, you got to use your 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 spiritual discretion and 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 let the Lord release, you know release that uh, authority for you to speak to someone about certain things because if it ain't going to point them back to Christ, if it ain't going to welcome them in, sometimes you need to do that. Sometimes people need to be rebuked, especially other uh, other brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, that's, that's what mainly we need to correct out of love because we want to see them do better. You know, iron sharpens iron. You know, it ain't about, it ain't about calling people out in front of other people and embarrassing them. But you take them aside and speak to them and, and let them know what's on your heart, what you observe. There's a way to go about everything. Everything ain't going about uh, coming out in front of someone and calling them out and embarrassing them and telling them that they're wrong. And that's not the right, right way to do things. You know, we need to do it out of love. You know, the first two uh, greatest commandments that Jesus said is to love God with all thy heart, mind, and soul. And the second that's uh, next to this is to love your neighbor as yourself. 
So, anywho, um, you know, just just think about that in our own times. You know, God had a you know a, a divine timeline, and there was a time He had uh, to avoid needless confrontation. We need to do the same thing. We always said we need to be like Jesus. He was the perfect example. Um, and I got little notes taken right here. You know, like four things. If you find yourself into something, like let's say I'm doing this Bible study in person or something like that, and um. You know, someone gets a little hostile to the gospel and they want to argue and, and prove that I'm wrong. And let's just take, take for granted, maybe necess maybe I am wrong about something and the Lord hasn't revealed it to me. Maybe I am interpreting something wrong. But I'm benefiting someone in this group, in this Bible study, right? And if I direct all my attention to them, someone I just feel like just trying to prove a point and trying to go back and forth with me and they're hostile, Maybe it's necessary that I just kind of avoid their question, just focus on and move on with the point, move on with the Bible study because someone's getting something from it. I don't want to, you know, focus on one on one sessions, some, you know, on something and, and ruin it for like maybe eight or nine others that's actually getting something from it. And that's just a distraction. Afterwards, we can take them to the side and say, hey, we'll talk about this afterwards. You know, you can think of any kind of example where this can apply to our life. But. All right, let's, let's move on to the next thing. All right, so you see he left for Judea, and he parted again into Galilee in the beginning of this chapter. And it says he needed to go through Samaria. And he meets the Samaritan woman. Well, do some doing some research, you, know, you need to find out who are the Samaritans. You know, you got to ask yourself this. When you find out who the Samaritans are and you get a background of, you know, who they are, where they come from, and what their situation is as far as how they're living, you'll see how, uh, just knowing the background, the backdrop, how some more significant things that are said is important. So, the reason almost all Jews avoid Samaria in any contact with the Samaritans was because there was a long-standing animosity and hostility between the Jews and the Samaritans. There was deep prejudice. About 700 years before Christ, the Assyrian Empire came and besieged Israel. Now, when they did, they took some of the Jews captive and they deported them back to Syria, Assyria and imported a bunch of Assyrians into the land of Israel. Now, Assyria, I believe, is supposed to be modern-day Iran, just to kind of give you an idea. Now, when they did that, and like I said, just kind of recap, they took over this part of Israel. They deported a lot of these native Israelites to Assyria. And then they imported some of the Assyrians into Israel. And the Assyrians, a lot of them, they married Jewish people. people. You know, and the children born from the intermarriages were called uh, the Samaritans. Now, they settle in this region of Samaria. Uh, this region of Samaria. And now, just keep in mind, they're neither Jewish and they're neither Assyrian. So the Jewish people never accepted them, and the Assyrian people never really accepted them either, either, you know, because they were what they called a mixed race, you know. So these people, these Samaritans, that's separate from all the other ones, the ones that the Jews didn't want or the Assyrians didn't want, which wasn't their fault, they, since they were mixed, they adopted the mixed religion. They adopted a lot of the, 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 the Jewish things, but not all of them. Uh, they adopted a lot of the Assyrian uh, beliefs, but not all of them, and the, the rituals and, and religion and stuff. For one example with the Jews that I've learned, one thing that they adopted is they, they adopted the first, they believe in the first five books of the Old Testament, the, the Torah, you know, the books of Moses. They don't believe none of the rest of it. Well, that's, at least that's what I've dug in and I've learned. Um, they don't believe in like the Psalms or any of the prophets, Isaiah or... You know, Jeremiah or Zechariah, none of that. They don't believe in none of that. So, anywho, just get, get an idea. So they're, they weren't allowed to worship in Jerusalem because, you know, they were what they considered a, a mixed breed and they didn't think they were fully Jewish and they wouldn't allow them to worship in Jerusalem. And the Assyrians didn't want them either. So that's where they're at right now. That's why, that's why she said that, you know, why are you talking to me? I could tell you're a Jew. Why are you talking? People don't talk to me. And another thing is, from what I've picked up on this old biblical culture is, you know, men did not talk to strange women that weren't their wife. 
So it was very odd that not only talked to a Samaritan woman, but he, he talked to a woman. She didn't know who he was. And so it was just shocking to her. Now, one thing that you must notice, it says it was the sixth hour. And if you're reading another translation, it's, it's already translated for you. But this is around noon. Remember, uh, I don't know if I said this in the last Bible study, but usually when uh, when the, the old English text, they were, they were saying that the sixth hour is usually how many hours from sunrise. So usually about six o'clock is when sunrise is, about six hours somewhere around noon. So what's odd here is this Samaritan woman, she's coming around noon, around 12 o'clock, 12, 1 o'clock, and it's the heat of the day. So this is very odd. Now it wasn't odd that a woman's going to the well to get water. And from what tradition speaks is this is what women did, but they did it in the cool of the day, in the late evening, when the sun was going down and it wasn't as hot. This is when women got together and, and it was just the women that gave them something to do to get out of the house. They all meet, meet with the other women of the town and, you know, catch up on things and talk and, you know, converse with each other and have a good time. This was their time out, away from the family. Well, she was by herself in the heat of the day. And why was she doing this in the heat of the day so anyway this was the heat of the day is anybody else able to hear me looks like my mom's on saying that she cannot hear me is anybody else live that can hear me let me know if you can in the comments Let me know if you can hear me in the comments. I'll check it myself. I don't want to keep going if nobody can hear me. I believe we can. So I'm going to keep on going forward. All right, so, so she's at noon of day. She's getting water. And we find out later in the text of why she's doing that it's because she's 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 avoiding the other women of the town we find out why she avoiding them because she's been married five times you know this is a small population also so she's been married five times and you know how people talk in small towns you know I'm from a small town everybody knows everybody's business you know everybody knows when you cut school everybody knows when you know, you started dating so-and-so. Oh, so-and-so's having trouble in their relationship. So, you know, every town is the same. And it's been like this for ages. So this is where we're at right now. So she's she's avoiding these other women. For all we know, one of her ex-husbands could possibly somebody else's husband. You know, they're probably talking bad about her. They're putting her down. She's the gossip of the town. You know, people calling her names and stuff like that. You can you can just leave to the imagination what's going, you know, through her head or what's what's been going as she approaches other people in town and she's just trying to get by that. So she's going in the heat of the day by herself to lug this water. So <clears throat> that gives you an idea on that right there. So let's just move on from that. And then she you know, she said to him, you know, well, she said, "Who is all right? You, you have no dealings with the Samaritans." He said, if, "If you know who you're talking to, this is what Jesus said to her. If you know who you're talking to, you know, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that said that you give me a drink, and you would have asked me to give you some living water." The bad thing about you know text and 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 stuff is you can't hear the the way it's said. You can't hear the emotion behind it. The you know, but. To me, it sounds like this woman's getting kind of snappy with him. She's getting kind of uh, sarcastic or in a way. When she says, you would ask me for living water. Like, Look, man, this is the way, this is the way I'm, I'm interpreting it, the way I'm reading it. And I could be wrong. You know, there's no way of knowing this. But she's she's looking at and This is verse 11. And she's saying to him, look, man, y'all have nothing to draw. You have nothing to draw with. You have nothing to draw water with. And the well is deep. And then you're going to tell me you've got living water. Come on, you know. She said, "All right, <laughs> this this is the way I'm reading it anyway. 
I don't know if, if you've ever read this chapter and thought this, but she's like, so are you greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank himself and the children and his cattle? You, are you greater than him? Like, who are you? That's pretty much what she's saying, the way I'm feeling. So what did Jesus do? You know, he he dodged <laughs> he dodged her question. He said, again, this is this is another way of staying on topic in a conversation when someone tries to disarm you or or ask you something that's not important. Stay on the topic, stay on the goal of the conversation, and move right and stay on topic. He says doesn't address her and respond to her question. He just says, Whosoever drinks of this water shall never thirst again. Oh, excuse me. Whoever drinks this water that you're drawing shall thirst again. But whosoever drinks of the water I give him shall never thirst. And the water I shall give him shall be in a well of water springing up into everlasting life. And what does she say? Her attitude changes then. Well, sir, give me this water that I thirst not. And neither have to come back here to draw water. She's thinking of of, of, of physical water, of physical thirst. You know, she's like, I don't want to come all the way out here in the heat of the day, hiding from everybody and having to drink water again. Like, you know, give me this water so I don't have to do that. But he's 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 not talking about that. He's talking about spiritual water. She's not getting that yet. So what does he do? He he says, Go call your husband and come here. And she says, Well, I don't have no husband. He said, you said it right, because you have had five husbands. And the one you stand with now is not your husband. Mm. <laughs> she said, sir, I perceive you're a prophet. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> you think, you know, after he just, some stranger that doesn't even know her just, just calls it out like that, you know. So she's already sparked her attention and her interest. And, uh, and what does she do? She asked, She asked. says, Our fathers worshipped in this mountain. And you said that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. And he says, Look, the hour comes that neither in in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You know, but you know, God is looking for the, the God the Father is, looking for, is uh, looking for people that will worship him in spirit and in truth. So, uh, I know from reading this and I know what that means and I had to try to get some help on how to explain this and I'm going to do my best at it and hey those watching later since y'all not watching tonight uh, feel free to leave in the comments section and um, you know leave leave your uh, you know just leave some um, interpretations or, or, or if you can think of a, a better way to explain this but you know wh what does it mean to worship in spirit and in truth you know in Matthew um, in Matthew chapter 15, Matthew chapter 15, uh, verses, verse 7 through uh, 9 said, he's calling out these people, he said, you hypocrites, but what did Isaiah prophesy to you, saying, this people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and he honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. You know, and uh, just a, I'll, I'll read in the NIV version also. It says, uh, I'll just skip on to eight. You know, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain, and their teachings are merely human rules. So God, you know, Jesus was calling them out then in the, in the Gospel of Matthew. You know, these he just recited what the prophet Isaiah had prophesied. These these people worship God with their lips. They go through these acts, but their heart is far from Him. You know, they they're not involved. They're not emotionally giving their heart to Him. They're not worshiping Him. How do you worship somebody in spirit? You know, you got to give it your affection, your feelings, your emotion, it's stirred up from your heart. You're giving it your all. So when you worship God, you're worshiping Him with your all. And you got a lot of people just debates on how to worship God. This right here clearly just lets you know as long as you're worshiping him in spirit and in truth, like you, you, you're worshiping him in the truth of God. You know the word of God. You're worshiping in that way. You're worshiping him with your feelings. You're giving him your all. You are truly giving him your all when you're worshiping him. 
And you don't have to necessarily worship him in song, but worshiping him in a song and dance is worship also. So that's another thing a lot of churches and different denominations always, you know, go back and forth on. And their way of doing it is they feel like the old traditional hymns of American, that's the way they should worship God. It has to be played with pianos and organs, nothing upbeat, no, 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 nothing too upbeat. And then you got more modern churches saying we should keep up with the times and, you know, it should, you know, be, be upbeats, have all these uh, different instruments and drums and, you know, you know, which one's the right way or the wrong way, you know. Look, as long as you are worshiping him in spirit and in truth, as long as you're doing that, it doesn't matter how you worship him. As long as it is sincere, that's the key word. It's got to be sincere. So I don't care if you listen to modern sounding music and you're singing along to it. As long as the words and the lyrics and the stuff that you're reciting is truth, you know, you got to have that discernment anyway, the stuff that you're listening to on your own in your car, you know, things that uh, you're singing at church. I mean, do your own discernment. You don't feel right about it. But, you know, everybody's pretty much mostly on the same page when it comes to worship. Just people have different tastes. Certain type of music doesn't hit them the same way, and that's okay. You don't have to condemn it just because that's not the music that your granddaddy did or, or your grandma listened to or grew up singing. You can still have verse. I, I love the old traditional hymns, you know, but y'all do know that there wasn't no southern gospel hymns back in Jesus' time, right? I mean, that didn't exist yet. So were they doing it wrong? You know what I mean? Do you not think that the traditional gospel hymns, I'm just speaking because we're in the South, do you think that the traditional gospel hymns were first worldly as far as the sound of it? It came from somewhere to inspire them to put Christian lyrics to it. You know? So it's, it's something to think about. You know, you got different sounds. They don't necessarily mean the sound of something is bad as long as there is truth in those lyrics. There is sincere truth in and, and, and godly worship in that praise. You know, so you don't want to sing to a certain modern music? Don't sing to it. You ain't got to be a part of it. That's okay. You ain't got to condemn it. I mean, that's that's your conviction, not not everybody else's. That's not gospel. You know, you do it your way. The other person does it their way. Why can't we all get along and respect each other and still know and, and, and that we are all worshiping the same God? You know, one thing I think that's, a bigger, biggest thorn in someone's side more than helping people find a place to worship is these denominations. We say it's the way they do things and in, in, in the way they serve and the way they worship is the way help them find a church that they prefer. But man, if you're preaching from the same Bible, man, and you're, and you're worshiping in spirit and truth, I feel like it necessarily isn't going to matter where you go to. As long as that preacher is preaching the truth, he ain't preaching his own convictions. As long as you're coming there to worship God, you're coming there to give it your all. You're going there to, to praise and worship the Lord in spirit and truth. You're not worried about what everybody else is doing. It don't matter what church you're going to. We, we shouldn't have to be concerned about these different denominations separating us apart. And Well, I don't like that type of denomination. They're too loud. Oh, I don't like that denomination. They're too quiet. Oh, this denomination uh, speaks with the Holy Ghost tongues. They, oh, we don't do none of that crazy stuff. This one runs pews. They don't. This one's too, you know what I mean? Like, you do you. The Lord will lead you into place, you know. So if they don't worship like you, you don't have to talk about them. You can acknowledge it, and if you prefer not going there, don't go there. You know, you find somewhere that fits you. You let the Lord lead you. You'll be where you're supposed to be. We don't have to put other brothers and sisters down. You know, we all serve the same God. You know, if if you feel like they're out of, you know, out of context, if the Lord puts it in you to speak to them about it, and they're they're wrong on something, speak to them. But if something, if it's not of salvation, that's a secondary issue, man. The main thing is salvation. That's the main issue. You know, as long as they're saved and they're trying to live a godly life, and man, look, we're all here to edify the body of Christ. I'm only on here right now, is to help others. You know, I've learned a lot. I just want to share what I've learned. I'm not done done learning. You know, I learn every day. I learn every time I read this book. I learn every time I listen to another preacher. I listen to my pastor. 
you know, I, I converse with other people, other men of God, and I like sharing with people that, you know, may not be Christian. You know, I, I love sharing with other people that are Christian, and maybe, you know, you can show them things. I mean, it's just an awesome feeling. You know, that's what we're supposed to do. So don't get caught up in that. Um, you know, I kind of, you know, chased a rabbit down the trail real quick, but that's just going back to worshiping God in spirit and truth, man. Be sincere. Give it your all. You know, you know, you're doing it all. You know, you're not putting on a show. You're not faking it. So let's move on. Um, I mean, a lot of this stuff's pretty much self-explanatory. She's, I love that verse right here. I love verse 26. Well, she says, she says, I know that Messiah comes, which is called Christ, and when he has come, he'll tell us all things. And he says, look, he says, I that speak to you, I'm him. I'm that guy. And, man, that's, I, I love that verse, man. That gets me excited, man. So, you know, all right, so this is where we're going to pick up. And upon this came his disciples. Oh, well, one other thing. I don't know if y'all thought this whenever you read uh, when you read this chapter before, but remember he, he came to the woman, he sent to the Samaritan woman, and he asked her to give him something to drink. And in verse 8 says, For his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. He had 12 disciples. They went to go buy meat into the store. Now given, you know, I kind of, I got an idea that this was a long traveling from where they were up until Samaria. And they're on foot, you know, they're they're walking. So, And it even shows that Jesus is tired, you know, because he is, he's still 100% human. So he's wearied, you know, he's tired. He's thirsty. They're hungry, you know, they need food, they need water. So, but that ain't the point. This is the part I thought was funny. He's got 12 disciples. Why do they all leave Jesus by himself? <laughs> it's just like it takes 12 men to go buy food. They're going to leave the master there by himself. I'm just imagining why are they going to leave the Son of God, the, the, the man that they're following, the man that they're a disciple of, by himself in a strange town that they don't know anybody? Like, why are they leave him there by himself? Come on, man, you got to leave somebody. But, you know, I don't want we coming to somewhere and, you know, everybody gets something, leaves me by myself. Hey, we'll all be back. No, I'm coming with you. We'll walk back together, you know. Well, he probably sent them on. It just ain't worded their way. I just thought that was kind of funny, but. You know, he no, he Jesus knew he had a divine appointment. He probably told them, "You guys go. I'll wait right here." You know, that's it's not listed. Just because it's not listed, don't mean it didn't happen. But it's just funny to think that it take twelve men to go to the grocery store, man. <laughs> but no, um. Anyway, so verse twenty-seven, <clears throat> and upon this came his disciples and marvelled that he talked with the woman, yet no man said. What seekest thou, or why talkest thou with her? And nobody asked him that. Why are you talking with her? The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and said to the men. So she left her water pot that she went to draw water with. She left it there and then went on into the city. She said to the men, Come, see a man which told me all things that I ever did. Is not this the Christ? So she went there just telling people about it. And in the mean, so then they went out of the city and came into him. So she went and told everybody that. And other people wanted to go seek this out and see, let's, what's this woman talking about? In the meanwhile, his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. Hey, we done went to the grocery store, man. Eat, eat. So Jesus said to them, I have meat to eat that you know not of. Therefore said the disciples one to another, Hey, has any man brought him aught to eat? Has any man brought him something to eat? Like they, hey, any of y'all, y'all know somebody brought him something to eat? We didn't travel this long way, got some food at the, at the, at the, uh, <laughs> Samaritan food line, and we did all that traveling, and he already ate. He ain't hungry. So Jesus said to them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. Say not ye there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest? Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes, and look on the fields, for they are white all ready to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit unto, eternal, unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. 
And herein is that saying true, one soweth, another reapeth. So he didn't answer. They thought he was talking about physical meat, you know, actual natural meat. And he was talking to them about spiritual meat, you know. And what's the spiritual meat? To do the will of the Father. So he's letting them know that the harvest is ripe. You know, it's already it's already ready. Verse 38, I sent you to reap that whereon ye bestowed no labor. Other men labored, and ye are entered into their labors. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him. For the saying of the woman which testified, he told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans were coming to him, they besought him that he would tarry with them. And he abode there two days. So they, so the Samaritans, that the lady went there and, and told the, the city about, they all came, they checked him out, and then they started believing. And it took that one woman, that one divine appointment from Jesus, speak to that one woman, for her to go out and go tell people. And look how many people it came and brought to Jesus. Think about that. It takes one person. It takes you. It takes you, Facebook. It takes you, YouTube. It takes us all in the church. It, us in a little small town. This woman who'd been married five times, probably been ridiculed. She's going in the heat of the day to do work that she could do in the cool of the night to avoid other women. It took her speaking with Jesus and knowing him for her to go out there and, sh and spread the gospel that she's met to Christ. And she brought all them people back from the town. And look, so when the Samaritans were coming to him, they besought him and asked him to stay with them. Stay with them. So Jesus stayed there in that town with them for two days. And many more believed because of his own word. So them people that stayed there, or excuse me, that came and asked him to stay there, many more believed after that. You know? So he said to the woman, now we believe. Oh, excuse me, the, the people said, and said to the woman, Now we believe, not because of your sayings, for we have heard him ourselves, and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. That's all they got. Hey, spark the curiosity. Look, you can't save them, but you can point them to the one that can save them. You know, it takes you to spread the gospel. You might not win them over at first, but all it takes is you just planting that seed for them to you know, really be thinking about it. And they might not come to right away. They might not come this week. They might not come next week. It might be a year from now, but you've done planted a seed. And all it takes is a little bit of watering. But there ain't nothing going to grow if you don't ever plant a seed. So, let's move on. Jesus heals a nobleman's son is what the rest of this chapter is about. So, <clears throat> now, after two days, this is after all this is taking place. After two days... He departed thence and went into Galilee. And Jesus himself testified that a prophet hath no honor in his own country. Then when he was coming to Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all the things that he did at Jerusalem at the feast, for they also went into the feast. So Jesus came again into Cana of Galilee, where he made the water wine. So that was, that was the place of the first miracle that we discussed before. In chapter two, where um, you know they went to the, the the wedding feast, and his mother asked or told him that you know that they're out of they're out of uh, wine, and he says, you know, woman, my time's not yet come. You know what you want me to do about it? And then he did something about it. So that that's that's the town, Cana of Galilee. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. Now when he heard that Jesus was come out of Judea into Galilee. He went unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So there's this man, there's another woman, his, his son is sick. He's traveled this good ways because he's done heard that Jesus is in Cana. He's, he's on the way to go see him to ask him to heal his son. You know, he's, he's, he's going this long way. He's got the faith. Or else he wouldn't have traveled all that way. Then Jesus said unto him, Except ye see signs and wonders, you will not believe. The nobleman said unto him, Sir, come down, ere my, or my child will die. And Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy son lives. 
That's all he said. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken to him. And he went, along, he went his way. So he told him that. He says, go, go ahead and go home. Your son lives. So he left. And when he was going down, verse 51, And as he was going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Thy son lives. Then he inquired of them the hour when he began to amend. What was the hour that he began to start feeling better? And he started asking people. And they said to him, Yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. The seventh hour again is probably around one o'clock. Around the seventh hour, the fever left him. So you can just imagine the surprise and the smile on that father's face. Verse 53, So the father knew that it was at the same hour in the which Jesus said unto him, Thy son lives, and himself believed in his whole house. So it took that miracle, and he believed. He believed it happened. It says it in the Scripture. He believed whenever he left Jesus that it happened, and then when he seen he had to confirm it. He like, around what time was this, was you suppose he started feeling better? And he told him the time. That was around the same time he spoke to Jesus. 54, this is again the second miracle that Jesus did when he was come out of Judea into Galilee. So, um, one other thing I wanted to say about the, the woman at the well, and we never knew her name, so that's why we all refer to her as the, the woman at the well. Um, I guess if you had taken any notes or anything like that, I had this, I seen this one preacher, uh, his commentary, he was saying that, um, you know, when I guess only, well, let me put it like this because I hadn't discussed this. You know, that woman had been married five times. So, and he was offering her liver and water. You know, a, a thirst. And she wouldn't thirst again. He was offering his spiritual water for her. What was she in need of? She was, she was wanting love, right? That's why you get married for love. But she'd been married five times. And she's living with someone now and she's not married. And, you know, divorce has got to be a horrible thing. Thank God that that's something that I've not went through, and I, no, nor do I want to go through. I love my wife. But you can imagine the, the pain, and, and some of you may have went through divorces. It's, it's got to be the most devastating thing. You know, you, you give your heart and your life to someone. You, you think you're going to be with them forever, and for whatever reason, things fall apart. And, you know, just signing that paper and separating from them, it's, it's got to be the most horrible thing to deal with you know it's like your life is gone and she's apparently been on that search she, she's been searching for love but man there ain't no love like the love of jesus you know there's no love like the love of jesus i mean you're just not fulfilled without knowing jesus without knowing that love that's our first love you know that's that's the person we need to fall in love with before we can worry about any other love and uh, I kind of did that backwards, but thank God, man, that that I've got my relationship with God. You know, He's the He's the love of my life, and uh, second is my wife, third is my kids. You know, fourth is the ministry God's put out before me that's it's growing, He's He's leading me to, and that's supposed to be the that's the the order that you're supposed to have. But man. Uh, I also heard you know, this. Is what I was about to say about a preacher. He did the commentary. Is you know we we get this from this movie. I think it was Jerry Maguire. <laughs> Jerry, no, um, was it? Uh, you know, you complete me, or and a lot of people that ain't the first time it's been said. But you know, like my wife completes me. No, they don't. You know, your your life, your your wife or your husband doesn't complete you. We we need to quit saying that. We know what you mean. You know what I mean? We know what you mean, but your spouse, your significant other, that it doesn't complete you. God, Jesus completes us. You know, Jesus is is love that's everlasting. That that's the love that we need now. Other love, our our spouses complement us. You know, our friends complement us. You know, but Jesus completes us. Yeah, if we don't have that love, man, we don't know what it feels like to be completed. You know, we got to have that. So, well, that's all I got for tonight. You know, the only God can meet the deepest needs of the human heart through a relationship with Jesus. And that's what Jesus was offering that woman at the well. But 
anyway, we're going to stop here for now. I know I was a little late going on. Um, I don't know how long I've been on, but hopefully I wasn't too long tonight. But I appreciate you guys tuning in. Uh, I didn't announce it because, honestly, I didn't really think I was going to end up doing it tonight. But anyway, I appreciate it. Um, hopefully I'll continue this next Thursday and I won't have any hiccups. Um, and we can keep it on that same pattern and maybe I'll cover a few more chapters next time. But I appreciate it. God bless you. And I love y'all. Y'all good night.